Welcome everyone to this uh, Cochrane Lecture 2022. Um, we today have the pleasure and honor of, uh, of listening from uh, Jimmy Vomick. Uh, Jimmy uh, is a, uh, a dear friend and a colleague from Cochrane from, uh, that was one of the people since the foundation of Cochrane. But Jimmy, in the past 11 years, was the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Science and is currently the Professor of Global Health at the Stellenbosch University. He was also the Founding Director of Cochrane South Africa at the South African Medical Research Council. And Jimmy is a very accomplished person. So in addition to a medical degree from the University of Cape Town, he also holds a MPH degree from Harvard and a DPhil in epidemiology from the Oxford University. Jimmy began his career as a general practitioner and uh, uh, in rural areas of uh, South Africa. Jimmy has played a leading role in promoting evidence-based decision-making both inside and outside Cochrane but also in addressing health and social inequities, building research capacity, and providing leadership in health science education in South Africa and all over the world. He has actually recently been recognized with two uh, honorary doctorates, one of them from McMaster University uh, because of his work on evidence-based uh, based, uh, healthcare. I'm here today with uh, Catherine Marshall, and we are co-chair in this session. And, uh, and I will now pass it on to Jimmy. Jimmy, it's a real pleasure to have you here today with us. Uh, but before I pass on, that i just been reminded that uh, give you some instructions of how can you participate on this presentation today. So uh, your microphone is muted to avoid any background noise, but you can use the chat anytime during the presentation if you have questions. These questions will then be summarized and we have 15 minutes allocating the end of the presentation to answer some of your questions, if not all. Um, if you have an issue with, uh, you know, you would like to see subtitles, you can just show or hide the cap captions uh, using the box, the CC box in your, in your page. So without, without further ado, Jimmy, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much to you, Carla, for that generous introduction. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen and then we'll carry on. Uh, I hope you can all see that, uh, and I will do that. Great, excellent. Um, Carla, is everything fine? Can, can I proceed? Yes, you can, Jimmy. It's okay, over to you well, now. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, um, uh, good day, everyone. I thank you very much for joining us today. Um, the Cochrane Lectures one is usually given at colloquia, and we haven't had one for some time. So it's really wonderful to be able to at least be together in this virtual format. And thank you very much for uh, being willing to attend this talk today. I'm going to uh, just show one slide by way of making some disclosures. I'm not going to talk through these points, but I'm going to just allow you a, a minute or so to just uh, absorb the information uh, before we move on. Okay, so... I thought for the talk today, I should try and cover four uh, topics. Uh, they're really in the form of questions here. One is, uh, the first is, what is global health? Thereafter, looking at what is global health equity and why does this matter? Uh, the third is, how is Cochrane helping to advance global health equity, in my view? 
And then finally, some thoughts on, um, you know, how can we do better? Where do we go from here? Turning to the first question, what is global health? Um, the most common way in which this term is used is shown in this slide. Uh, while it is not the only definition uh, uh, of global health, it is the, it's the one that's most often embraced by people living in the global north, uh, where more than 95% of global health uh, programs are located. Inherent in this definition, is a power dynamic, which sets people in rich countries up as the experts, uh, sometimes as the saviors, who are needed to help poor people in so-called developing countries. This, unfortunately, sometimes leads to uh, phenomena such as global health tourism and parachute research. In global health tourism, students uh, from the global north, um, you know, come to uh, the poorer countries uh, on expeditions, on internships, on electives, uh, and have a good holiday. And often this is at the expense of uh, the local popular, the local uh, staff that accommodate them with very little benefit in it for them. Parachute research is similarly extractive um, in nature. And uh, here yeah, the, the researchers from highly resourced settings obtain data and samples uh, from LMICs often, and as a result gain prime authorships uh, on papers without appropriately acknowledging the use of local infrastructure and expertise. And often without uh, establishing um, long-term equitable collaborations uh, and partnerships. Now, it must be kept in mind that global health did not appear from nowhere. It has its historical roots in, for example, colonial medicine, tropical medicine, and international health. And as a result of this connection to the past, it hasn't quite managed to shake off some of the values and practices of past era. The, I call these the, the legacy issues of, of, of global health. Now, these issues are fairly well covered in um, a number of texts, some of which I show here. Uh, and just to point out that this includes a, a re very recent report of, uh, showing that tropical medicine at the London School of Hygiene and, and Tropical Medicine uh, had a very close relationship with colonial exploitation in Africa, uh, and elsewhere. So that connection between global health now and the previous incarnations of global health must be kept in mind. And it, global health therefore brings with it a number of issues, uh, we can call them um, baggage, um, including the fact that it's rooted in imperial conquest and colonization. So this speaks to power relationships. It also uh, has connections to discrimination through, you know, practice of white supremacy, racism, and paternalism. And something we still see very clearly today in global health is the is the focus on infectious diseases. Uh, these are so-called health security threats, and this goes way back to uh, the past where in order to um, support colonialism, uh, interventions or strategies had to uh, be put in place to protect people going into these countries where they were exposed 
to uh, infections that uh, they were they had not previously been exposed to yellow fever for example malaria etc and today the em emphasis on SARS and HIV etc uh, could be seen as an extension of that now during the period of tropical medicine the germ theory became well established and with that biomedical approaches to deal with diseases, often single diseases, so-called disease eradication programs. And so today in global health, there is still this emphasis on the biomedical uh, in interventions, uh, and again, the focus on single diseases. And the opposite of that is a relative neglect of issues to do with the health system in um, developing countries and access to, to health care, which was re never really a key factor in, in the past. And so that continues not to really be emphasized to the extent that it is needed. And finally, it undervalues often the importance of social and economic drivers of health. Now, if global health is to free itself from these legacy issues, then you know, it really needs to be reimagined, reconceptualized. And here for a moment, I want to just acknowledge the work of Paul Farmer, who recently died, who wrote the book in Reimagining Global Health and many others, um, because he really helped um, not only to he not only helped us to rethink uh, what global health research and practice could be, but also uh, you know himself set the example of how to implement global health in a way that supports local populations and builds local capacity. He's by no means the only person thinking through uh, what global health should look like today. And so I'm showing you here a consensus definition published in The Lancet, uh, in which a, a group of, of practitioners and researchers got together from across the world. And this definition is gaining quite a lot of traction um, uh, in, in, in uh, around the globe today. And, I'm not gonna read through the whole thing, but just highlight the six points that I think are key uh, to the understanding this definition. The first is that global health is about achieving health equity uh, for all people worldwide. So it's not just about health of those poor people out there, but it's also health on my doorstep. And it has to do with addressing inequities wherever they occur. The second point is that, that many diseases uh, and health conditions today are transnational, they cross borders. And so whether you're looking at infectious diseases or whether you're looking at um, non-communicable diseases related, for example, to the food system, or whether you're looking at climate change issues, these are all transnational and those issues are particularly pertinent uh, to, to global health. Thirdly, um, or is the, the fact that, that global health emphasizes the need to go beyond the health sciences and to promote interdisciplinary collaboration. This is very important, as you will see in, in subsequent slides that I will show. And then finally, and this is what I really liked as somebody who was both a clinician and worked in public health, it brings back together these two domains, uh, population prevention and individual clinical care. And I think that you know, at some point in history, public health was sort of uh, you know, separated from uh, clinical practice and, and that I think had very unfortunate consequences. So global health is trying to bring all of these uh, areas back together again. Now, the Copeland definition, which I've just shown you, um, has put health equity at the heart of global health. 
And so I think it is appropriate that I just take a, a minute or two to talk through some of the basic definitions and uh, the ways of understanding health equity. So according to the WHO, uh, health equity is achieved when everyone can attain their full potential for health and well-being. The Commission on Social Determinants of Health, led by Michael Marmot, uh, the report you'll see on the slide as well, uh, says that health equity, inequities rather, are differences in health status or in the distribution of health resources between different population groups arising from the social conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. And then the work of uh, Margaret Whitehead and others, which predates the commission uh, and, and its report, made the distinction between different kinds of inequality. So health equities are a specific type of inequality. They are inequalities that are, can be considered to be avoidable uh, and, and therefore unjust and unfair. So that is what we're referring to when we talk about health inequities. And then my last point really is that the quest uh, for health equity is motivated by the belief that all lives are of equal value. It is motivated um, uh, through a sense of fairness and the notion that health uh, is in, in fact a human right. Now, if this is not something that you feel comfortable with at this last point, then I don't think you're going to get too much out of the talk that I'm, I'm giving today. So let me just stress a very important issue. And that is the connection between soci socioeconomic factors and health inequity. What you see on the slide at the moment um, is a graph showing the life expectancy at birth, which varies in some high income countries from about 90 years to about 50 years in some low-income countries. So a gap in life expectancy of 40 years. On the right, you'll see a, a similar picture, this time showing the burden of disease. So a composite of premature mortality and morbidity. Uh, uh, and this shows where the concentration of the burden of, of, of disease uh, lies. And you can see it's predominantly in Africa and a few other places in the world, which carry the burden of, of disease. And so once again, these are not things that are happening by chance. These are not things that can be explained on the basis of genetics or biology. They're clearly linked to social, and political and cultural factors. The next point I want to make is equally important. And that is that health inequities exist everywhere. This is one of M Michael Marmot's graphs in which he shows um, the life expectancy at birth by neighborhood income in England. And what you can see between the difference between the most deprived and the least deprived areas is an, a life expectancy gap of almost 20, 20 years. And this is in England. Um, and there's a gradient going from the most deprived to the least deprived, as you can see there. So, when we're talking about health inequity, the, the take home message here is when we talk about health inequity, there is so much we can learn from each other, no matter where we find ourselves. And so this is not just an issue between rich and poor countries, but this is an issue that everybody should be talking about. 
And so given this connection between health, social and economic factors, and environmental sustainability, the United Nations has set 17 goals with specific targets to which all countries have signed up. These are goals that we need to, to work towards achieving. They call the Sustainable Development Goals, and they, they call for action to end a wide range of issues, including poverty and inequality, uh, action to protect the planet, and to ensure that all people enjoy uh, health, justice, and prosperity, and that no one is left behind. And I think that uh, perhaps in Cochrane, we have not engaged sufficiently with the sustainable um, uh, uh, development goals, and, and perhaps it is time that we take a closer look at how we might be able to uh, contribute to a greater extent to the achievement of these goals. Now, in order for us to do this, we do need to be clear on an important, some important distinctions. The distinction between health and healthcare, as well as health equity. What I'm showing you here are some extracts from a report of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in the United States, which was aptly entitled, Healthcare's Blind Side. So it says, firstly, that healthcare itself plays a surprisingly small role in life expectancy. Social circumstances, environmental exposure, and behavior are estimated to account for 60% of the risk of premature death. It goes on to say that a growing body of research shows that today's healthcare system and its focus on treating medical conditions neglects the significant role that social needs, such as nutritious food, transportation, adequate housing, and employment assistance play in the health of Americans, and especially the most vulnerable among us. And I believe that unless we understand this difference between health and health care, we may well not succeed in our efforts to address health equity and move that agenda forward. The picture on the right uh, is an attempt to kind of uh, sum up really what the implications are. The implications of not understanding these issues is that we spend all our time fixing the, the, the branches, the leaves, uh, uh, and we neglect the root causes of the problems that face us. So I am heartened by the fact that this message is starting to get through to clinicians. What the text on the left shows is um, a quote from the Lancet again, Currently, the social determinants of mental health are acknowledged, but little is done to change them or advocate for the establishment of environments that enable good mental health. And it says this recalibration is crucial because addressing social determinants could have more impact on mental health than health sector interventions. Now, if there was ever any doubt about the relationship between social factors and health, then the recent COVID-19 pandemic experience would surely have dispelled that. We have seen in COVID how infection rates, hospitalizations, and mortality have been grossly unequal between various subgroups in the population. And we've also seen how the disease and our efforts to contain it have led to deterioration of, of the social determinants of health and worsened inequalities. So this connection is real and strong. And I believe that it is really time for us to address this now and not later. Health 
health equity is our goal. But for us in global health to achieve it, we do need strong partnerships. And these authors um, have highlighted the connection between global health equity, which is, it, 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 or, uh, sorry, health equity, which it calls uh, the products and the partnerships and processes that help to achieve that. And the bottom line really for me is that equity, diver diversity and inclusion in partnerships are absolutely fundamental for achieving effective processes which can lead to global health equity. And that is all I wanted to say by way of background. And I'm going to spend the next few minutes really looking more at Cochrane and to see if uh, how Cochrane is helping to advance health equity and what more can be done. So let's first look at Cochrane's vision. It says our world, it, our vision is a world of better health for all people, where decisions about health and healthcare are informed by high quality evidence. I have absolutely no problem with this, def, this vision. I think it's a lovely vision, and I think it makes the point very clear. When it comes to the mission, I do have some reservations. The first sentence I think is, is, is fine. We are an independent, diverse global organization that collaborates to produce trusted, synthesized research evidence, uh, making it available to all and advocating for its use. Again, no problem with that. Then it goes on to say, our work is internationally recognized as the benchmark for high quality information about the effectiveness of health care. And I believe that this introduces uh, the, the, the conflation of health and, and health care and confuses the issue in the minds, not only of us working in Cochrane, but also it reinforces that belief in the, and that perception in the general public. And so personally, I would like to see that word at, or even that whole sentence be removed. So I've taken the liberty of rewriting Cochrane's um, mission with apologies to you all. Uh, but as a suggestion, I would like to say we are an independent, diverse global organization that collaborates to produce trusted, synthesized evidence for promoting health and health equity, make it accessible to all and advocate for its use. So I'm just gonna leave that there and see uh, what you think about that uh, maybe during the discussion. I cannot talk about equity or health equity without acknowledging the excellent work being done by the Cochrane Methods Equity Group, uh, which is uh, working closely with Campbell, so it's a, it's a combined methods group, and they've done a considerable amount of work uh, looking at, um, first of all, helping us to be aware of the, um, the factors uh, that can be examined uh, as equity issues to see what the distribution of the effects are across these factors. So they call this the progress factors, and there's also progress plus, which adds a few more items that you can see. I won't read through it. It goes from place of residence down to social capital. And you can look at the effects across of those, uh, across those subgroups. Uh, the equity group has also worked on providing guidance uh, to us on when to consider health equity in reviews, what methods to use to identify and appraise evidence, um, how to report evidence, including in summary of findings tables, and how to interpret uh, the findings related to health equity in discussion. And they've also provided some useful checklists, for example, the, pres the PRISMA equity uh, list uh, for the incorporation of equity issues and guidelines. 
Now, again, this is important work, this is necessary work, and this is work that I think needs to continue. There is also um, the future of the work within um, uh, Cochrane and, and also the Cochrane Equity Group. Uh, we're very happy to announce that, uh, if you know, don't know this already, that the Equity Thematic Group uh, has, has been approved by Cochrane, and so they will expand the work on equity through this thematic group. There's also worth mentioning a, uh, a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in the US uh, to support some work on uh, racial health equity. And so we look forward to what will emerge from that group. And then Sean Trewick and Declan Devane is working on a project looking at equality, diversity, and inclusion. So all of these must be uh, these efforts must be acknowledged, and uh, and um, you know I, I think uh, this this is very important work. But what I would like to point out is that there, there is some areas where I think we need to really start having a closer look. The first of these is, um, and I've looked at, at this specifically for, for this presentation. And the question here is, how well do uh, our Cochrane reviews map to the conditions that are associated with the world's greatest burden of disease? I think that's a fair question to ask. And just um, to give you some background, there's a global burden of disease group um, and they're inter fairly international, coordinated from Washington in the US. They look at bur the burden of disease measured in terms of disability life years or DALIs. And this is a, a combination of the number of years lost due to premature mortality and the years of healthy life lost due to disability. So bringing in a more morbidity component. The 25 conditions that you see on the left of the screen are the five, oh, sorry, are the 25 conditions that constitute the greatest burden of disease. Something like 64% of daddies are accounted for by these 25 conditions. And so we wanted to look at, um, you know, how does this map to the topics of Cochrane Reviews? And the first thing that we noted was that the top 25 conditions, again, shown on the left, or 25% of daddies there, these conditions are addressed by only, by less than 20%. Of, of the review. So our systematic review efforts are not necessarily aligned to the conditions associated with the world's greatest burden. Also looked at here are the 25 conditions again and showing the number of Cochrane reviews. And I don't want to talk about this in detail, but it gives you an impression that there are some areas where we're doing really well. For example, 200 systematic reviews on stroke related to, the, to this area. Um, but there are uh, other areas such as road uh, traffic injuries, uh, falls, self-harm, uh, even tuberculosis, where we have relatively few systematic reviews that have addressed uh, these important conditions globally. So this is perhaps an area which I think we need to look at more in terms of priority setting and uh, explore how we can uh, you know, develop questions that are important to answer uh, in order to address these conditions. I also looked at uh, the equity issue, the health equity issue, uh, by trying to see how Cochrane reviews are contributing uh, to addressing social factors that are contributing to health inequities. Uh, now, the, the, the diagram on the right here, it comes from uh, Dahlgren and Whitehead. And again, this predates the work of the WHO on this. And it shows the determinants of health, 
showing that, uh, and this is just reinforcing what I said earlier, that there are personal factors that are responsible, individual life, and lifestyle and genetic factors. There are social and community networks that can impact on uh, your health. And then there are the major socioeconomic, cultural, and environmental conditions. And you can see they go in the, 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 the section in green goes from agriculture and food production, uh, education, work environment, right through to housing. And so what we did was we generated a similar list uh, and we said, let's count the number of Cochrane reviews that directly address these, these, these uh, factors in order to reduce uh, or to improve health. And what we found was really quite disappointing that only just over 1% of Cochrane reviews directly address these subjects. And you'll see uh, the breakdown according to the category uh, there. Very few reviews actually directly address these issues. So uh, what do we look at in Cochrane? We look at essentially um, biomedical and clinical interventions and some health system interventions, but the broader socioeconomic, cultural, and environmental conditions are relatively neglected in Cochrane reviews. I will also just say this in passing that through in the process of looking at uh, the, the reviews, we also noted that terms such as health inequity, poverty, racism, sexism, et cetera, and the various variants are almost never the central focus of Cochrane reviews. And we recognize if, if you've ever worked in a, in a situation uh, where uh, you know, there is poverty or there's racism, you know how important these issues are to health and how important it is to see how we can address this in our, in our interventions. But let me just say that, um, I'm going to try and I'll just clear my screen a little bit here. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm just, there we go. So um, there are, having said that there are very few of, of such reviews, there are some really important ones that can be mentioned. And I'm going to give a few examples here of of reviews that directly address social determinants of health. And they include uh, this review on um, uh, the first one listed there, health services and outcomes in low and middle income countries. Um, um, community level interventions for improving access to food in low and middle income countries, housing improvements of health, uh, and associated socioeconomic outcomes, um, community coalition driven interventions to reduce health disparities among racial and ethnic minority populations, um, and financial arrangements for health systems in low and middle income countries. So the point here is that we are doing some of these reviews. They are just, there are just too few of them. And we, I, I would like to use this opportunity to encourage us to increase our activities in these areas. Now, as I've mentioned, in order for us to achieve health equity, we do need equitable partnerships. And so Cochrane's activities around equity, diversity, and inclusion are very important because that determines how well we work together to prioritize, and to address issues of health equity globally. Now, Cochrane has always aspired to be global and diverse. Uh, we've seen this right from the beginning. It has included its, in its foundational principles, um, enabling wide participation, promoting access and striving for relevance. The question is how well are we doing uh, in, in this department? So we looked at the diversity, firstly, of Cochrane Review authors by country income. And whether you look at all authors or whether you look only at contact authors, 
you will see that the producers of Cochrane reviews largely come from high income countries. And if you look at low income countries, you need a magnifying glass because they, these numbers are vanishingly small, 64 for all authors and only 12 for contact authors. So there is a problem here. Within these income groups, and these are World Bank uh, in, uh, income groups, um, there is also some variation within these, these sectors um, uh, by country. So for example, you see much greater activity in the UK, in Canada, in Australia, uh, in the US, uh, for example, than some of the other uh, high income countries. And similarly, also in Africa, you see a great variation in terms of, um, of the number of Cochrane authors. Now, that's the producers of the evidence. What about the users of the evidence? And this, for me, is extremely worrying, too. But you will see, and I'll just point out one thing here, the proportion of people accessing the Cochrane Library website, um, the, 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 the row that I've highlighted there is the proportion from low and middle income countries, and it looks like it's only 12% of almost 9 million visitors uh, to, to the Cochrane Library. So uh, if we want to change things in low and middle income countries where the burden of disease is greatest, then we need to do more to try and get the evidence um, to the right people. What about leadership? And there's been quite a lot in the literature recently about leadership positions in global health organizations. And I won't go into, we don't have time to go into that, but let's look at Cochrane. So in the governing board, a fair distribution of, uh, a good distribution uh, of gen in terms of gender, um, in the language, but again, the maldistribution in terms of country in income. Similarly with the Cochrane Council, uh, again, uh, you see a similar pattern. And again, you see the complete absence of low income countries, people from low income countries. What about the editorial board? Half female, 18 from high income countries, 14 English speakers. Again, same issue. And because the equity methods group works on equity, I wanted to look at the, that group too and see how well they are doing in terms of diversity. Um, and here you see an even more worrying picture that 16 out of 17 members in the core team are from high income countries, of which 12 are from Canada. Now, you know, people involved here should be lauded, should be supported. And I don't think they're trying to keep anybody out of this group. But what this message is, is that we need to up our game in terms of getting more diversity into all of these groups. I then want to just touch on briefly the listening and learning report. So Cochrane um, has identified uh, diversity and inclusion uh, as a, an important challenge and, and, and something that we need to address with some urgency. And so, again, I'm very pleased about that. And so recently, uh, there was a survey um, in which uh, 1,300 people participated. And the bottom line here is, the, in summary, is that diversity and inclusion recognized as essential to Cochrane's mission, but six out of 10 people in this study said that they did not feel as included in Cochrane as they wanted. Those that were not currently involved described difficulties in getting started in Cochrane, which is a real issue, which we'll come back to. Uh, next, uh, many people describe Cochrane as being too centered around English speaking contributors. And finally, our leadership governance and central team should be more close, should more closely represent the global and diverse organization we aspire to be. 
So what do people recommend? That diversity and inclusion is essential for Cochrane to achieve its mission. That was the position it, it presented. It acknowledged, uh, acknowledging that Cochrane is not as diverse and inclusive as it could be and has, and that we have work to do to address the systemic institutional biases in Cochrane that we need to target and support people from low and middle income countries and people who speak a variety of language to be decision makers and authors and, and volunteers. And this brings me then to uh, my last two slides, which is really to try and sum up uh, what I've presented and present uh, some suggestions for uh, the way forward. Firstly, We've seen that Cochrane reviews do not currently include a primary focus on health equity. Most reviews deal with actions within the health sector, such as clinical treatment and individual health education and behavior change interventions. So our recommendation here is that we prioritize a set of review questions that address health inequity through actions on the social determinants of health. And very importantly, in, as part of this, we have to include people with lived experience of inequity in our equity methods group, in our views, and in any other activities uh, in, in Cochrane. We have to clarify the distinction, I believe, between healthcare and health uh, in Cochrane's mission. I've already stated that, and in other relevant documents. And we need to encourage more interprofessional and interdisciplinary collaboration. What about uh, conclusions and recommendations around diversity and inclusion? I think it's noteworthy that Cochrane acknowledges that it has not lived up to its aspiration to be a diverse and inclusive global organization. And so in order to reduce bias and to be more relevant and sustainable, it has committed itself to a plan of action to include and retain people from a diversity of geographical locations, genders, languages, et cetera. How can we do that? Now, the first thing I'm going to say is the following, that all Cochrane contributors should read the listening and learning report, which I've referred to earlier. I think it, 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 it's not perfect, but certainly gives you a very good sense of what people are experiencing as they are trying to engage with Cochrane uh, um, as novices or even people that are well established within Cochrane. We, we then have to implement, I believe, a series of conversations to explore and understand the issues raised in the report so that we can discuss the systemic, the structural, and the cultural forces, as well as the systems and processes that serve as barriers to diversity and inclusion. We have to engage people with lived experience of exclusion and develop strategies to address these issues jointly with them, not for them or on behalf of them. Secondly, we need to learn, I think we can learn from good examples of global collaboration within Cochrane. I think there are collaborations that work really well and also you know, examples from other areas. Uh, and some of these examples go way back to when Ian Chalmers set up the pregnancy and childbirth group and how they worked uh, globally and incorporated people from many parts of the world. Number three, we need to actively identify people from low and middle income countries. The idea that if you build something, people will come is just simply not correct. We have to go after people. And we need to um, go after people from different income levels, and especially low and middle income countries, and people who speak a variety of languages. We can think of supporting them uh, through mentorships uh, and, uh, and, and through other ways to, to enable them to become authors and decision makers, et cetera. I'd like to make this point because one of, one of the people in South Africa really drove this one home to me very, very clearly. And, and you know, the fact that capabilities existing in low income countries are often not sufficiently recognized and utilized, where people are putting up their hands to participate in methods groups 
or in, in review groups, et cetera, and are simply being ignored. That is not acceptable. And some of the work of Lawrence Bagbo and, and some of his colleagues have shown that people who have conduct in Africa who have conducted Cochrane reviews are now preferentially publishing reviews in non-Cochrane journals uh, rather than having to experience the, the, um, the kinds of, of things that they have experienced within Cochrane. We have to improve the friendliness, speed, and quality of responses to people who express an interest in Cochrane. We need to provide more clearly provide guidance on Cochrane processes, which are often very complex, especially editorial process, and we need to simplify these processes where possible. Five is we need to increase opportunities for participation. We actively have to do that if we want to draw people in. And we need to make that information about these opportunities well known through appropriate channels that reach the correct people uh, or the intended people and provide some funding support uh, for their participation where possible. And then the last thing I wanted to say is that we need to monitor progress on um, diversity and inclusion for all Cochrane groups, um, not as a, as a uh, you know, to use a, a, a big stick, but to be able to celebrate successes where they happen and also to provide support where people are struggling. So that is it. Uh, that's all I had to say for now. Um, let's just get out there and do it. Like Mandela said, always seems impossible until it's done. I want to just particularly acknowledge some of my colleagues here who have participated or contributed in some way to this presentation, either by helping with analyses or uh, sharing information that I could incorporate into the presentation, or just to, to give me an opportunity to talk to them about the, the ideas that I was starting to formulate and how to present them. So thank you very much. I couldn't have done this without you. Thank you. Jimmy, thank you very much indeed. I think it's over to me now. I'm Catherine Spencer, Chief Executive Officer of Cochrane. Uh, I joined in July. Um, Jimmy, what an amazing lecture, and it really was music to my ears. As um, Chief Executive Officer working uh, across Cochrane and, of course, closely with Carla Suarez Weiser, to look at what Cochrane 2.0 looks like. Uh, and I even love that because that's certainly what I'm calling it too. Um, it really, I think, enormous amount of your observations were incredibly familiar to me. Um, I worked, as you may know, for three and a half years in Dhaka in Bangladesh at ICDDRB, a big public health research organisation there with some really fantastic um, colleagues in, working um, across a whole range of public health um, issues, and that includes Dr. Tamid Ahmed, who um, is the first Bangladeshi executive director of that institution. And, and you know, indeed, maybe that should have happened earlier. Um, and while I was there, Peter Pyatt's work on the various stages of global health was something we, we often talked about. So what you said really chimed with me today, and I'm, I'm not going to disagree with any of it. Um, I think that you have given us enormous food for thought. Um, I think Carla was smiling uh, as I watch, as I listened to your lecture, because it's very similar to where I see we can make such enormous difference with Cochrane. Um, we are an organisation that's transforming. We do already recognise we need to make things simpler. Um, and I think you've given us some incredibly good pointers there. Um, so, so thank you very much indeed. I certainly understand the challenges of local health systems. Um, and I think as well, it's really important that we consider what we can learn as well from low resource settings, particularly as we're under significantly more stress in the global north from lack of resources. So thank you, thank you so much for some really, really good ideas. Um, and we look forward to working on those with you. Um, but I was going to move on, if I may, Jimmy, and I hope you're still there. I can't actually see you on my screen um, to just ask you some of the questions. So you've had quite a few questions come in. I think there was an enormous amount of um, 
uh, agreement on the need for us to review our mission statement and people liked your ideas and made um, made some comments there. So I'd like to ask people to continue to put um, their comments. I'm just going to pick um, pick out one here and wonder if you would answer it, uh, which is uh, from Carmela Krelzer Jarek. She asks, um, you refer to health interventions of curative type only when talking about 10% and the percentage would be higher had you included health promotion and prevention health activities, which, for example, address risk factors of infectious disease and chronic disease um, and vaccine, basic hygiene, nutritional and other behaviours such as smoking, alcohol and exercise. But I, I'm guessing that's what you sum up, where, where you sum, summed up, where we, the areas of reviews that we're, we're lacking. Yeah, that's that's quite a long question. I'm not sure I, I got the whole gist of it, but, but just to say that we, uh, in extracting the um, the reviews that looked at the social determinants of health, we didn't look particularly at any um, interventions that were aimed at individuals in in a, in a healthcare setting, but rather the broader health. Uh, care issues, uh, and they were of all kinds, curative, preventative, promotive, uh, whatever it, it may have been. Uh, so we didn't make a distinction on that on that level. Thank you. Um, and another question, and apologies, because I can't see on my screen who it's from, but um, the question is, they say, if Cochrane targeted more of the conditions associated with high disease burden. Do you think that the reviewers would then find that there was little primary research to synthesize? In other words, is there not only a problem with the synthesis, but also with the focus of the primary research? I, I would argue it this way. Um, I would say that the decision to do a systematic review on a particular topic should not depend on, uh, you know, whether you think that there is sufficient research. <laughs> First of all, you don't know until you start doing the review. And secondly, even if there is no research at the time that you do the, the particular systematic review, it could serve as a prompt to people. And I'll give you one example of that. When we, when we looked at interventions to improve adherence to TB therapy, the first time we published that review, looking at directly observed therapy for TB, there wasn't a single um, clinical trial that uh, we found. Uh, that review got published uh, in the BMJ, I believe. And as a result of putting that out there, um, I, you know, a number of trials have been conducted. I've lost count now, but it is probably about 20 trials since that review was published where we actually flagged the fact that we need research on, on a particular topic. So, you know, doing Cochrane reviews is not just about informing decisions about a practice or policy. It's also, in, it's, it's also about informing decisions about future research and highlighting the need for it. Recognizing where there are gaps, I, I completely yeah. get that. Um, I was also really, um, I was delighted that you mentioned the sustainable development goals, um, because that's something which we absolutely recognize um, we need to focus on those critical issues um, and questions working uh, towards um, the sustainable de development goals, but also working with our members locally to understand what critical issues are. Um, I thought there was a fan back chart showing um, the review areas that we work on currently and, and where we and comparing that to where we need to move to in the in the future is quite stark. Um, so um, Jimmy, I think there was nothing in your your um, lecture which I didn't disagree with I, I thought it was um a fantastic and you almost disagree like with everything is that what you're saying Catherine sorry 
Are you saying you disagree with everything? Oh no, no, I agree with everything you say. I thought that um, I thought that it was great and like a blueprint for where we need to really focus our effort in the future. And certainly in terms of um, when we're thinking about that strategy, we recognise diversity and inclusion and ensuring that more people from um, the global south for want of a better expression are included in that and that's certainly something I recognize from my experience working in DACA um, so so thank you so much I think it was a great lecture and I can see people really thought it was incredibly compelling um, and all of those areas are ones in which we want to work with you and the community further to understand what Cochrane 2.0 looks like so Thank you so much, Jimmy. We're dead on four o'clock. Um, I think uh, we'll, we will have a look at the chat questions afterwards and be feeding that in and also the ideas from your lecture today, which was great, but very many sincere thanks. And um, I know that you, Ma, you, me and Carla will have an enormous amount to talk about as a result. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and Carla, you're on mute. Just to say, uh, I think it's been a great amount of editorial challenge as well that we're going to have to take forward. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.